just going to help the brokenhearted? Well, we are today. And I prayed and I asked the Lord to direct people in this morning that wouldn't normally come. I asked God to do it to people that would tune in and watch in and switch on to YouTube and even just scan and through and sort of find this message because this is a deliverance message. This is going to help break the chains from off them. I read a story many years ago and I took note of it and I thought one day I can use it and today I am. The forestry commission workers that were assigned to the giant redwoods of California were shocked the early morning they started their shift and walked down into a conservation area and there lay one of their famous trees lay dead on the forest floor. It was 12 centuries old which is young in comparison to most of them because most of them in Iran were three or four millenniums old. Millions of years old are these trees. This was relatively young. It was 12 centuries old. And the shock took them by surprise. There had been no storms, there had been no flash floods, no earthquakes, but there it was lying on the forest floor. So they brought in the scientists to find out what had happened and they cut sections of the tree away and sent them for analysis. And the study of the rings inside the tree, it laid bare the story of the life of the tree itself. It would seem like thousands of years. Actually, they were able to pinpoint it to the Dark Ages. Somewhere in the Dark Ages, that tree had felt the, the shattering effect of an earthquake. It had done some damage. It had wounded the tree. But the wounds, the, the, the tree was able to survive it and fight it and fight against the, the wounds and survive. It was further found that during the Renaissance period across Europe, that the tree actually battled for its life against a fungus, a life-threatening fungus that attacked it. And it was, took a long period of time, but the tree managed to overcome that. It was even found in further study of the rings in the tree that during the time of the pilgrims, when the pilgrims were arriving on, found in the sides of, of uh, United States of America, at that particular time, lightning had struck the tree with such a blow that it took another century or two for the tree for to recover from that devastating wound. The, the, the rings that they examined was able to tell about the times of strength and the times of, of storms and, and they were able to determine the growth of the tree in those periods of history. Sometimes the tree only grew eight inches in a century because, the, because of the climate of that times and in other times it had grown 36 inches because there was no stress in that century that it was there in. But it was recorded that in 1810, a careless Indian campfire, that, a, a fire that got out of control. It left a 13-foot scar down the north side of the tree. Insignificant, 13-foot, insignificant comparison to the tree that's 360-foot high. It's so like 105 meters high. To what a small scar it was insignificant to this massive tree that weighs 500 tons. But let me tell you, because of, this, because of the wound that was there, it also damaged the supporting roots. And according to the Scientologists, according to the tree people who examined it, they could see that that tree had fought the infection and fought the wound for 120 years. But it was a wound that never healed. And because it was a wound that never healed, they drew to this conclusion, that on the morning that it fell, it didn't take a hurricane, it didn't take a tornado to bring it down. They reckoned because of the damage of the open wound, that all it would have needed was a little sparrow to land on the top of the branches. All it took was a squirrel to run on the outside branches. And the weight of that was enough to tilt the tree and topple it and bring it down. It's five years ago, I suppose, if the bird had landed, that the squirrel had went. It wouldn't have made any odds, but at that time it did. It was a proverbial statement which says it's the straw that broke the camel's back. It wasn't the weight of the bird. 
It was the damage that had been done and the wound that was never treated. I meet people all the time who live in the same because their wounds are never treated. And the people and they live on a knife edge, the slightest thing, just they fly into a rage. You know what I'm saying? They just fly into a rage. Sometimes they just they don't say anything, they just walk off and go to bed. Some of them reach for the bottle. Some of them will do things that they never normally do at that moment of time. Some of them will say things that they had never normally say. A wound that's left unattended. Now, now there's some people will, will try to help you and say, but we'll tell you something, but we know that time heals. No, a wound that's left, time doesn't heal it. It gives it time to fester till that disease gets right down into the very core, the very substance, the very structure. It eats away at the very core of a human heart or a human being. The Bible calls it the root of bitterness. That, that, that begins to take seed, it grows up. It, it just took something simple to get it going. But if it's not dealt with, if it's not repented of, it's not pushed to one side, if the if ministry is not given, it can turn. People, they, they end up being resentful or they're being jealous with devastating effects. Think maybe it was things that was said or maybe it was things that was never said. Maybe it was something that was done or something that was left undone. Maybe it was your fault or maybe it wasn't. But whatever, because it's never dealt with, the destruction begins on the inside. I've met them. Because usually they're what is known as the life and soul of the party. In the older days, they were known as socialites. In this century we live in, they're known as party animals. And they're party animals. And they smile for every occasion. They laugh and they laugh with you and pat you at the back. But when it's all said and done and they say good night, they cry themselves to sleep at night. Tormented. Constantly visited by the ghosts of yesterday. You can't sit in the house. You can't sit for two minutes. You can't sit for one hour. You can't sit in the house because the house is like a prison now. So they've got to get out of here and they've got to get going. And they wonder, 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 will things ever get back to normal? Maybe it was that you had no closure. Maybe that's what caused the scar. See, the actual terminology for broken heart in the Bible is this. It means overwhelmed by grief or disappointment. So one moment your life was full of dreams and hopes and aspirations. And then suddenly a candle snuffed out. Suddenly that person's not there anymore. You never got to say what you wanted to say. You never got to do what you wanted to do. And no time now because it's over. And there's no closure. And there's a wound now. And that wound will not heal. Maybe it was an alcoholic parents. Though and I have dealt with people over the years, and it's all traced back to how they were treated at home. Alcoholic persons are even living in an abusive relationship, or even just abandoned by someone just when you needed them most, and they're gone. What was meant to be bliss turns into a nightmare real quick. And now you sit with an open sore. Some people bury themselves in work just to get rid of the thoughts of their mind. They can bury themselves in work. Some of them bury themselves in alcohol. Some of them bury themselves in drugs or some other thing to get rid of the heartache. Others that can't and don't know how to do that, they just get angry and bitter on the inside. I need to tell you now that the world has absolutely nothing to offer you. Most of them don't understand where you're coming from, where you live, and what you're going through, and very few even care. They don't care what happens to the brokenhearted. But God does. But God does. He had it written in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20. It says, are not two sparrows, just little dicky birds, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? They're worth nothing. But one of them shall not fall from the sky, except your father sees it and knows it. He goes on to say, the very hairs in your head are numbered. So he said, fear not, you're more valuable than many sparrows. 
He's letting you know, I know who you are, I know where you are, and I know where you're stuck. I know what happened to you. And God says, I have an escape route. I have the way out of this. The world doesn't. In fact, in a very fast-moving world that we live in, where, where nobody knows even who the Joneses are. When I was growing up, nobody had a whole lot. You were, you, people lived trying to keep up with the Joneses. Now we don't even know who the Joneses are. We're just keeping up with somebody somewhere. You've got you to gotta have the best phone. You've got to have the best thing. And let me tell you, you run a rat race. You've got to have the best fashion, the latest fashion, all the weight loss products that can get their hands on, the age-defying creams. You just rub everything on, drink it if necessary, because you're in a rat race, and the rat race started the day you left school. Some of you, the rat race started before you left school, and it's been relentless in pursuing you over these years. In this world we're living in, it's real easy, really easy to get overlooked, to get stepped on, to get ignored or get left behind. And it can render an open sore. Causes you trouble all the days of your life. David one time stood over the grave of Saul and his son Jonathan. Jonathan was his best friend. Saul was his king. He had this remark made. Out of all the things he could have said, he made this remark in 2 Samuel chapter 1, and verse 19. He said, The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. Then he answered this question, asked this question. I don't know if he shouted this out or just murmured this under his breath, but he said, How are the mighty fallen? How are the mighty fallen? David made that remark as he stood over a grave that day, knowing, knowing the lives of those two individuals. They're at the top. He's the king and he's the king's son. He's got it all. He's got it all going for him. He's all thinking, but how, how, how did the mighty fall? I can tell you. Because he didn't deal with the wounds that was on the inside of him. He didn't deal with them. Saul was full of insecurities. Saul was full of rage and full of jealousy. And the truth of it is he had no need to be. But somebody sang a song one time about David. And said, David has, has, David has, has killed a, 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 a 10,000. Saul killed 1,000. David killed 10,000. Hey, you know what I'm thinking? What does it matter? He saw his king. What does it matter if his warriors killed 10,000? He can pick up the victory. And he said, yeah, that's my boy. He's working for me. But no, 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 no. Jealousy got in. How dare they talk about him and give me no praise? How, how come? And, and, and let me tell you something. That jealousy began to eat on the inside of him till insecurities come. David couldn't even come in. And why should they sure say anything? But I'm watching you. I'm watching you. And when David sung a song, then Saul threw a javelin at him to try and kill him. They're not normal. That's not normal activities. But it is of a person who has an open wound and never got it dealt with and never got it healed. And the open wound ended up to this guy. Let me, I, I wrote this down in my notes. That long before the Philistine arrow pierced Saul's heart, Saul was already a dead man. He had no life. He walked in bitterness and rage and resentment. To me, that's not living. I want peace. I want to lay down at night and sleep. I want to be able to wake up in the morning with a phrase, not looking over my shoulder, not wondering who's, who's catching me out. I, I don't want to live like that. I want to tell you something. There's open wounds in people's hearts, and you have to get them closed before the Lord. There, it's a delicate matter. You can't just go to any counselor. You can't just go to any doctor. You can't just ask your granny. And I'll tell you why. Get a hold of this scripture, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He said, another parable I put forth unto them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto man that sowed good seed in his field. And while the man slept, the enemy came, his enemy came, and sowed tares amongst the wheat, and then he went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and the fruit was produced, then appeared the tares. And so the servant of the householder came, and he said unto him, Sir, did we sow this in the field? Or from where now as all these tares grew up? And he said, the enemy did this. The enemy did this. So the servant said, will we go and tear them terrors back out of there? And the man in his wisdom said, no. He said, lest you gather the terrors and uproot the wheat at the same time. The dealing with the brokenhearted is a delicate matter. In the wrong hands, 
sympathetic as they might be, well-trained counselors as they may well be. <laughs> it can be a disruptive matter if they pluck the wrong thing out. It can take the goodness out at the same time. God said to that man, don't tear the tares up because it's so entangled in the good stuff that if you go to take this out, it'll rack the good at the same time. I'd like to tell you something. The things in your life are so ingrained and so deep and so entangled in your good world that God says, only I know how to remove them. He said, I can reach down on the inside of you and leave the good and snatch out the evil. I can mend a broken heart without touching this in a second of time. There's no surgeon on the face of planet Earth can do it. God's tender, loving care has the ability to hit the right spot at the right time. He knows what to say. He knows how to say it. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, he said, Jesus Christ said, the Spirit of the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. He's upon me. He has anointed me to preach to the poor. He has sent me. He sent me to heal the broken hearted. That makes Jesus Christ the specialist at that point in time. He said, I'm the only one on the face of planet Earth at that time that was anointed to reach down and heal the broken hearted. Now that anointing is given unto fellow men, given unto laborers like ourselves. He said this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He said, now come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall rest, you'll find rest upon your souls. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. That's those that feel that you're swimming against the tide. Nothing seems to work. Nothing seems to break through. Nothing seems to happen, but you keep trying. You're swimming against the tide. You're bowed, bowed over with the burden. You're weary now and you're well done. He said, you need to come to me and come to me quick. He said, I want to give you rest. He said, I want to do an exchange. I want to do a yoke exchange. He says, here's what we'll do. You give me yours and I'll give you mine. Mine's easy. Mine's full of peace. He said, I, you need to give me your trouble. You need to give me your broken heart. You need to, for a moment, take up all the pieces and give it to me entirely. People have a habit of trying to fix their own world and fix their own broken pieces together, and I'll solve this. No, you won't. You don't know how to. You do not know how to do it. But God says, give it to me. Give it to me. I'll fix it. Your problem up to now is, is you have given, but then you've taken it away, and the next day you go back for more medication or more treatment. You keep going back and you keep talking about God says, no, give it to me and leave it with me. And he says, don't walk away empty-handed here. Take this, take mine onto you instead and speak of that no more. Don't talk about it anymore. Just, just take what I've given you and talk about that and rejoice in that and sing in that. Psalm 147 and verse 3 out of the Amplified Version says, He heals the brokenhearted. I got news for you this morning. The surgeon of heaven has arrived. And he said, I'm here to deal. I'm here to do. He says, I heal the brokenhearted and I bind up their wounds. I read and I picked the Amplified. It says, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. He's the one that knows how to do it. I don't know what you're feeling, how you're feeling, how often you're feeling, but he's making a statement to you this morning. I know how to heal you. I know how to fix that. I know how to mend that. But you've got to come to me. Yeah, as long as you're running everybody else or trying to fix it or hoping it'll go away, it will not go away. It's an open sore. And it'll follow you and it'll haunt you. Psalm 34, verse 18, Amplified says, The Lord is near unto them that has a broken heart. Well, that's not good news. He's, he's close to you this morning, and he saves those that has a cr are crushed in their spirit, contrite in spirit, truly sorry for their sins. Whenever, if it was you, and you get the full heart, say, God, forgive me. He, he heard you the first time. He said, okay, it's absolved. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you. Don't worry about that anymore. Don't, don't deal with it. Just come get, get a hold of everything I have for you, and go on now with life. He said, I'll fix you as you go. I know how to heal the brokenhearted. In the second letter to the church of Corinth, 2 Corinthians, I'm going to read it out of the NIV version, chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Praise be to God, 
Paul wrote this, Praise be to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort who comforts us who are in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble were with the comfort that we receive from God. So he said, I want to comfort you, Joe, so that you can go out and reach others that's in the same type of trouble, and you can comfort them with the comfort that I give you. See, it tells me right there there's two types of people. There's those that's born to minister, and then there's those that needs ministry. So what does become of the brokenhearted? The answer really this morning is up to you. As long as you think that your own goodness and your own strategy and your own mental capacity, as long as you think that, that you can pull this together, then you'll never see yourself needing God to do it. And as long as you keep God out of the equation, it never goes away. You'll carry it. It's an open wound. It's a deep wound. And sooner or later, you'll topple. And it doesn't take something big to happen. It's the sparrow that landed on the top of the tree. And the squirrel that ran under the outer. But it's just something simple. And you crack. Because the wound was never healed. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And he wants you to know, he said, I can heal your broken heart. As long as you give him all the pieces. Leave nothing in there. Give him all. And, and you go away and pray. And you come back and here's another tear. Just, I, I forgot to give you this one too. And give it to him and don't pick it up anymore. Pick up what he gives you in exchange. I'm closing. This has to be one of the shortest messages I've preached in my lifetime. But it's effective. In Psalm 23 and verse 3. Psalm 23. Everybody knows Psalm 23. But verse 3 is is relevant and significant. It says, he restoreth my soul. When something is restored, it's always, always better than it was the first time around. Always. And God promises. He promises a better way. He promises a better life. He promises a better future for ourselves and for our family. You've got to remember that wound that you have that causes all types of ripple effects is affecting your family. Your children are watching you. Your family's having to deal with you. They don't want to. They'll pay for you to go on holidays alone. They'll tell you to go shopping. They'll empty their bank account to give you the money to go shopping so that you get out of the house for 10 minutes and you give their head peace. Your torment is racking and it's an open sore. And God says you don't have to have it open any longer. I've come to heal the broken hearted. So what started it? Who said what? Who did what? How did the enemy get you? Was it a person? Was it somebody you loved? Was it somebody you hated? What happened to you? The enemy is a master at this. He, the, that scripture about the church, he says, he came and he planted the church, and once they're planted, he took off. He went. He doesn't have to hang about anymore. He knows the damage is done. You won't fall in 30 years, but eventually it'll get you. How are the mighty fallen? I don't ever want to have to think that over your life. I've watched people come and go over the years. And it was never a flurry, a flurry of attack at the moment. It was always something that was festering behind the scenes. Something, something's destroying your health this morning. Something, something's destroying your family. Something is setting you up for an ambush that will steal every moment. It'll take your dreams and make it into a nightmare. God wants to give you closure. He wants to resolve the issue. The bad people don't go away. The bad things don't stop happening. But he heals you and gives you the ability to go forward like you've never seen before. The ability to go forward triumphantly and take back what the devil stole. 
We're dealing with your life this morning. This is not an autopsy where you're dead and we're having to cut you up to see what happened to you. This is while you're still alive, he said, I see the wound. I see the wound. And this morning I want to fix it. You don't have to carry it for one, not one more minute, not one more day. You don't have to carry it. Carrying it's over. The yoke exchange is about to happen. Spirit of the living God, before I come into this building, I invited you in. During the week, as you were talking to me about this message, I, I saw people, I saw their hearts, I saw their bleeding, I saw their wounds. I heard names, I saw faces. I know what you're doing. I know you just don't push your way in. You're a gentleman, so you wait on people responding. The Holy Spirit of God. At this point, it's just a message until you move. And at the point, Holy Spirit, where you move, it's no longer a message. It's an anointing that settles the issue. In Jesus' name, I'm going to help you now. We're going to have a prayer line right here in front. Have I been talking to you this morning? If you're ready to step up, if you're ready to do something about the wound, then you're in the right church. I will never say anything that would embarrass you. I won't ask you anything about your life. That's none of my business. My job is to transfer anointing. That's what I'm here for. God says he wants to do something, and I believe him then something's got to happen in this building right here and now. Now, I understand that message will be going out probably on Tuesday. It'll be going out on Tuesday, and then other people will be affected by that. But there's nothing like being in the room where God is moving. There's nothing like that. You can listen to this on YouTube, and I guarantee it's not the same. When you're in the place where God is, it's different. So he's dealing with you now. So I'm going to ask you right now, if I'm talking to you and you're ready to move, then take a step up and come on up the front and come up now. I guarantee you won't be on your own. I guarantee you won't be on your own. Well, you're not on your own because the Holy Spirit's here. But there's people all over this place. I, 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 I said to the Lord, so I wish the place was full. I wish we had to have three services to get it all in on this one message. Because it's so poignant and so relevant. Laura and I, before the lockdown came, and when we used to do meetings all over the Southern Ireland, and we preached any message on rejection or, or brokenness, it was always the same. Hundreds of people would come and line up, waiting on the Spirit of God to do something, waiting on Him. There's no use sitting down there if God's up here. So I'm going to start, for time's sake, we're going to start. When we get near the end, Sylvia's going to put the cattle on. In fact, she's away doing something now. And we're going to minister to your physical needs. But what's more important now is that God does, gets to do something for you at this moment of time. So are you ready? Spirit of the living God. We do invite you. 